for your faithfulness. Amazing Lord, how far you have come. We're grateful for all you have done for us time and again. come through again and again we want to say thank you Lord thank you for sunshine of rain wholeheartedly thank you Lord thank you we'll say Hi everyone, welcome to IES Online Service. My name is Yuan, I'm part of Online Service Ministry and Church Database Staff. I would like to welcome you for those who are new, 
there will be a link down below in the chat board you can type down your name and everything and we'll connect to you and don't forget we have communion during the service so prepare yours wherever you are enjoy the service good afternoon church have Happy Saturday to you all. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you, whether you're here physically or watching online, welcome to IES. And you're all here on a very special, very important day to our nation. It's 17 Agustus. It's Independence Day. So happy Independence Day. I have my batik. Merdeka. Merdeka. I have my batik here, we have kebaya, and I see some people wearing red and white. I'd love to see it. Okay, before we start our service, let's just open up in a word of prayer. Okay. Father God, we just thank you for being such a gracious and loving God. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us here, for allowing us to live in a nation where we can freely worship you. Lord, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for our leaders and we thank you for the people of Indonesia. We thank you for the people who are here, Lord. We pray that you prepare our hearts and prepare our minds as um, we get ready to worship you. We pray that you soften our hearts so that we can take in what you want to speak to us today. Thank you, Lord. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. How fitting it is to celebrate Indonesian independence when we truly celebrate the independence of being no more slave to sin. Amen. Freedom in Christ. Let's all worship the Lord and let's stand up to our feet. i 
Don't remind me of my sins. You don't remind me what a fool I've been when you choose to forgive. I'm completely clean. You don't bring up all past mistakes. I've made today, but you always find a way to pardon me again. I'll be there for how wonderful to be loved by you. Oh, I. So blessed, my soul's at rest. I found favor. I found favor in you. When I am down with guilt and shame. All the memories flooding in, then your word enters in with a gentle wind. So if the sun sets you free, you are free. So if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. I'll be full, how wonderful to be loved by you. Oh, I'm so blessed, my soul. I'm 
sing it with me. How beautiful, how wonderful to be loved by you. Oh, I'm so blessed, my soul's at rest. I found favor. found favor in you. Something beautiful. Something good. And all And all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. Sing it with me. Something. And to pray together with everybody here. One of the things that people come up to me in, in this church and in our church in Nice Club of Guiding, they come up to me and go like, Pastor Mario, I thought in IES we're a Pentecostal church. Now, for those of you who don't understand that term, I mean, it's a very complicated term. It's a very loaded term. But it's basically saying this. What Jesus did that we see and we read in the Word of God is yes and amen, yesterday today and tomorrow can i hear an amen and with that faith we pray so it's up to you if you're baptized by the power of the holy spirit and you want to speak in tongues i would encourage you to if you feel more comfortable speaking in bahasa indonesia merdeka 
we'll, we'll, we'll appreciate that too. You speak in Ambonese, come to me. I'll pray together with you. You speak in English, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. What matters is the attitude. Do you believe that the same God that is in us today, the same God that is going to hear our prayer, the same guy who is going to act on behalf of us this evening, is that the same God that we read in the Bible? And if your answer is yes, I don't care what church background you are, you can be a Pentecostal or not. If you pray as if the same God is here, then I promise you, you will not leave this place the same as when you came into this place. Can I hear an amen? So this is what we're going to do. If you have a need, I want you guys to lift up your hands. It could be something big. It could be something small. We'll take the ones in the middle too. Can you please lift up your hands if you need something? Now, here's the thing. Sometimes it's not about you. It could be your parents. It could be your children. It could be your neighbors. I don't know who it is, but you're saying like, Lord, I want somebody to pray for me together with me. Lift up your hands. And I want, we were going to pray together. Gather around. If you're not lifting up your hands, you can come closer to the people who are lifting up your hands. And as you can see, you, there's nothing to be embarrassed of. Pastor Dave is in front. He's lifting up his hands. So don't be embarrassed. You can go over there. Yeah. By the way, Pastor Dave is that guy over there. Nobody's still going to pray for the pastor. What kind of church is this? I left for 10 years. and All right, there you go. Come, come, come closer. Come closer. All right. Let's pray together. You guys pray first. You guys pray first, and then we're all going to pray together. Please, again, feel comfortable lifting up your prayers in any language that you feel comfortable with. Hallelujah. Our God listens and our God heals. Hallelujah. Father, it's not our words, it's not who we are, it's not what we've done, it's not whatever we're going to bring to you. It's about you, it's about your love, and it's about what you have planned for us as individuals, as family, and as a church. Lord, we live, this is the time when it's just so difficult just to go to church sometimes. It's just so many things holding us back. So it is privileged to be able to be here and pray with the people of God together in this church. Lord, we, we, are, we, we are here because we know that you hear our prayers. We are here because we know not only you hear, but you're doing something right here, right now. We're not just asking, we're also receiving in Jesus' name. We pray for healing. The same God who healed those people in the Bible, we pray that you will heal today. For those who are not feeling well, for those who have family members who are struggling right now in the hospital, for those who, are, who, are, who have family members who are not strong enough to go to this church today, we speak healing in Jesus' name. Father, sometimes it's not our physical body, but it's our relationship. So many relationships are broken. So many people... Are, are, are just not in the right relationship with the people that they're closest with. It could be their parents, it could be their children, it could be their spouse. Lord, restore our families. That's the last promise we receive in the Old Testament, Lord. Before Jesus came into this world, it says the heart of the fathers will turn back to the children. And vice versa. Lord Jesus, we pray for unification of family. We pray that that relationship will come back to life. In Jesus' name, Father God, let us humble ourselves. Let us examine ourselves. And let us be the first one to reach out and restore this relationship in Jesus' name. For those who are lonely. For those who look at themselves and they're not happy. For those who consider themselves as failure. Remind them their identity in you. That you die for them so that when you come back, we can all live again. That's how precious they are in your name. So I just pray, Lord Jesus, 
that each and everybody here, no matter what they face, no matter what kind of difficulties, it could be something that beyond our understanding, beyond our previous experiences before. But Lord, we are your children. You are our Father. And we ask in nobody's name but your Son, Jesus. So let us be who you want us to be. We pray for these nations. We pray for the leaders of this nation. Whoever the president, whoever the governor, Jesus is king in this place. We pray for more churches to be planted. We pray for more people to rise up and, 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 and more people be used by Jesus. Father God, this country belongs to you. This nation belongs to you. This city belongs to you. May it be in Indonesia as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. And finally, we surrender ourselves to you. Our family is yours. Our life is yours. Our dreams, ambitions, desires, weaknesses, everything is yours. So use us as you want to. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, all God's people say, eh? Amen. Give glory to God. Happy Saturday. Yeah, good evening, everybody. It's, it's, uh, so something funny happened. I, ha I haven't preached for a few weeks, and during the time when I wasn't preaching, I took advantage by going downstairs and greeting people, and that was a lot of fun. And I was doing that this evening, and I was so enthusiastic, I forgot that I had to get wired up. And so I was coming out of my office, and, and then Benny was running around looking for me, and, and, and then I said, you got to get, get wired up, Pastor Dave, and everything else. So anyway, it was a lot of fun, and... and uh, uh, I, I, think I, I, I think I have a future as a greeter anyway. So uh, take out your phones and please check in on your phones. Go to the Church Center app and check in yourself. I checked in for myself. I checked in for my wife. And uh, so make sure you do all that. Now, I want to just remind you that what we're doing in this month is based around this theme of how to deal with how do you feel. How to deal with how you feel talks about having emotional health. And all of us need to have emotional help. Now, I, I spoke from that, and next week, Pastor Anthony is going to be doing the remix, which is simply the same thought with some of the same biblical principles worked in through the focus of another person's thinking and another person's preparation to bring it to you. However, to be fully invested in this presentation of relational health, which is coming up, financial health, which is coming up, a job, job health, which is coming up, and the things that we've done, you need to be attending a small group. Uh, we just went over something in the last um, de in the deacons meeting this morning, and uh, that was that when we did six weeks in a row in, uh, in Living on Purpose, over 500 different people attended a small group, which was a phenomenal result. However, with this change and changing, when the small groups don't happen six weeks in a row, we haven't had as much buy-in. My wife and I, we have a gathering on, uh, the next one will be, it's the fourth Thursday of every month. The next one will be August 22nd at 7 p.m. For those people who aren't part of a small group, they can come here. And we were thinking, ah, you know, maybe 50, 60 people, that's not quite, quite been that big. But if you don't have a small group that you're in, if you haven't had an opportunity to watch the video, and discuss the video that is called Five Steps to Emotional Health, you're missing out on the opportunity to be able to find this process of getting this emotional help. So I want to just encourage you, be here next weekend for Pastor Anthony for that remix of the message, and then be in a small group. Okay, uh, what we're going to do now is uh, I'm going to be sharing some things, and my topic is called Healing at the Table. We're going to be taking communion together, so I hope you all get some communion elements. I'm going to invite you all to stand to your feet. Please excuse me for sitting. It just, uh, it just makes it more complicated if I stand. And we're going to read together. We're going to be reading together from John chapter 2, very famous story that actually has something to do with what I'm going to preach though not perhaps in the way that you would be thinking. Let's read together out loud, reading from John chapter 2. The next day, there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, 
and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, that is not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for the Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servant followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it came from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. The host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Canaan in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After the wedding, he went to Capernaum for a few days with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. Let's pray. Now, Father, what an amazing story, and there are so many different things that people read into this story, but I pray that you would speak to our hearts, not entirely in this story, but we also want you to speak to our hearts through the things that I'm going to be sharing. And so I, pr I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be open to your Holy Spirit and that we would be finding a way to find the healing that we need at the table of the Lord. I pray these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't sit down yet. You have three minutes. You know what soap is? A scripture, observation, application. I'm going to ask each of you to think of an observation about this thing that we just read and share it with somebody nearby you, okay? Oh, I noticed this, I noticed this, okay? Go ahead and do that. Make sure you introduce yourself. Don't be shy, you know. If you see somebody standing around looking shy, make sure you just, you know, jump in and introduce yourself. And then when you're kind of bored with the people you're talking to, but you can't really say that you're bored, so just you can go ahead and sit down and, and yeah, we'll let this unfold. All right, I need some veteran soap people here. Steve Angsono, what was your observation from this text? Please speak loudly. It's an interesting passage, yeah. In some translations, he just calls her woman, and it sounds really rude. There is no rudeness implied in the original language. It'd be like if you referred to your mother as Ibu. You're not insulting her, right? Uh, if you're from American South, you call her ma'am, something like that. Okay, thank you. All right, who else is going to, who am I going to pick on over here? So, uh, anybody want to volunteer and share their... Uh, Corey has a good observation. A Corey has a good observation. Come on, Corey. Come on, Corey. All right, Jesus is a problem solver. Excellent. He's polite to his mother and he's a problem solver. Anybody else notice anything else? W one more. Anybody? Yeah. Please. I'm sorry, you're going to have to talk louder. I have an ear problem. So.
All right, all right, excellent. I understood most of that, and I'm sorry, as I get older, I can't hear. Pretty soon, you'll just be in my eyes. So anyway, excellent. Okay, this is what SOAP is all about. We want you to join SOAP groups. You read a scripture, and then you, you just discuss. What do you observe there? And then, of course, the last step is, what does it mean to you? And so that's something we want you to do. But if you study the Gospel of John, which is what we're reading now in SOAP, by the way. If you study the Gospel of John, uh, one of the main themes of the Gospel of John is this thing of transformation. And one of the things that you want to observe in this whole process is that the, the first miracle that's told, John's the only one who tells this miracle, it's this miracle of transformation. Water gets turned into wine. Now, there's a whole lot more there, and this sermon tonight really isn't going to be about that. But... What we all understand is that what we're dealing with here, how to deal with how you feel, is being transformed from our wounded lives, where the things that we've been hurt by, into the lives that Jesus wants us to have. How many of you were here last 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 week for one of the sermons we we had? You remember the five people on the screen? Yeah. Five people on the screen? Yes. Ah, there they are, yeah. And, and so past, uh, Steve Cuss, who preached for us last week and said, you know, he thinks he should be all of those five. And of course, the point of his whole sermon was that we're not supposed to try and be like somebody else. That's not what God has called us to be. So I was thinking about using that as an illustration. So I thought, here's another one. Yeah, there we go. So I, I was thinking I should say, ah, oh, we're all supposed to be like Jesus. But, but then I thought about it, and that's kind of a high mark for everybody, isn't it? Yeah, I think it'd be easier to learn to play the cello like Yo-Yo Ma than it would be to, you know, to, to learn to be like Jesus and everything. And then I came up with the real answer. <laughs> Jesus has called me to be me, and he's called you to be you. He's called each and every one of us to be the person that he wants us to be. He's not asking us to be transformed into something else. He's asking us to be transformed into the person that he created us to be. That every aspect of your life that has not been crushed and distorted by sin is exactly who you wanted to be. Now, you can debate all you want about you know, a nurture nature, is it your inherited characteristics or the things that have happened to you? But everything that has happened to you actually is a part of what God has seen in your life from the very beginning. He has a plan and purpose for your life. You're not supposed to be like Naomi Campbell. You're not supposed to be, you're supposed to be like Jesus, but you're not supposed to be felt guilty. You're really supposed to be who God created you to be. In fact, we need to understand that we are God's masterpiece. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Okay, there we go. He has created us new in Jesus Christ so that you and I can do the good things he has planned for us long ago. In other words, God prepared you to do the things he has prepared for you to do. You have been prepared for those things You have been prepared through the circumstances of history. You've been prepared in all of those ways. And God wants you to accomplish those things. He wants you to be the you that you are truly created to be because there's something for you to do. Now, what happens to all of us is that this whole process gets sidetracked by sin. During uh, COVID, when we weren't allowed to go anywhere, I decided that since I wasn't going around and walking around, I needed to get a little bit of exercise. So I started swimming in in a pool. And I would try and swim. And it was it was a little complicated because there's sunlight on the pool most of the time. So I, you know, I I learned that I had to put suntan lotion on my head, which I never had to do when I was younger, and to put suntan lotion on my back, and I would swim and everything else. And after a little while, I noticed that there were a few spots on my arm. And as I looked at these spots, three or four small spots, they were, at first they looked like like maybe mosquito bites or something like that. They weren't much trouble, but they were itchy. If you Zoomed with me, or if you saw me when I was recorded and doing online preaching, and please, if you didn't watch our online sermons, don't tell me, okay? (laughs) Oh, Pastor Dave, I never saw it because I never watched you preach online during COVID. Okay, don't say that. But I would sit there, and most of the time I'd do like this. 
And those were these itchy spots here that were itching. Now, they weren't too much trouble, but eventually I, ne I realized there was something going on there that wasn't good for me. So I went to see a dermatologist. Now, when I went in to see the dermatologist, the dermatologist looked at me, suggested facelift, head polishing, Botox. He wanted to do a few things to my eyes. And then he realized was that all I was there for were these little itchy spots that had, in the course of time, become small sores. They were no longer little bumps. They were, they were, you know, they were open wounds, not dramatic wounds. My arm wasn't falling off or anything else like that. And he looked at it and he said, okay, this is your problem. Now you gotta understand, my ancestors came primarily from Ireland and Scotland. If you live way up in the north, it's a blessing to be pale because the, you know, the, the, the sunlight that you get for like two hours a day for three months of the year, it can actually help your body. In addition to that, it's a blessing to be able to be an efficient storer of calories. So my ancestors needed to survive one week on one potato, and, and we were able to do it, and that explains a lot about my ancestry. But the problem is, is that my people weren't developed or weren't gifted at dealing with sun rays. And if you look at my skin, you'll see that there's all kinds of sunspots all over it. And when I was younger, I, I swam, I was a competitive swimmer, I played basketball in the sun, we all wanted to get as sunburned as we possibly could. And the dermatologist told me, I can't do that anymore. I've had so much sun exposure that these little spots are not going to go away. They're not going to get better. They're not dangerous, so don't misunderstand. They're just going to be sores. They're going to be itchy, and they're going to get more like sores, you know. Now, the solution was this. There was a lotion that I needed to put on. I needed to put on a lotion, I needed to put it on uh, every day, I needed to be careful at night to cover it, and if I put on the lotion every day until the lotion was gone, the spots should be healed. But one more thing, I had to stay out of the sun. So I could get healing from the wounds that I had, but I also had to stay away from the source of the wounds. So there's two things that needed to be going on here. Now, I hope you guys are good enough at allegories that you can kind of figure out where I'm going with this. Because what I'm going to be talking to us is about our own hurts. This is what you and I are wanting to be looking at. And I want you to understand that the issue with your hurts is that there's two things. Number one, your hurts are keeping you from being the person that God created you to be. Let me give you an example. Your, your emotional well-being, your, your personality. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, refers to it as your digestion. Okay, So my personality is when something bothers me, I get upset, I get really upset, and then I'm done. It's really easy for me. If somebody hurts me, it's easy for me to forgive them most of the time. I don't get credit for that. The bad side of that is I get really, really mad really, really quickly. And so I have, I'm working on, as a Christian being changed by God to get rid of the anger. But I don't get credit for the personality, but, but then I think, oh yeah, that's why God made me a pastor. Because that ability to forgive things and, and put things away, not to be emotionally involved, is a valuable thing as a pastor. So this is the gift that he gave me of that personality. Now the question is, how, how distorted do my personality gifts get because of sin? How distorted do your personality gifts because of sin? the things that happen to you, the choices that you make, the choices that others make around you. How do we get over these things that impact how we feel? How are we healed from these things? So I want to share with you a couple of things that are really important. And these things, and then I want to talk about the third thing and, and getting the healing. The first thing that's really important for us to understand, and this is what we're understanding in this month, is that we need to be honest about our hurts. Most people aren't honest about your hurts. There are two things that happen. Some people hide their hurts. No, it didn't bother me. You know, especially men, like, you know, I can take it, you know, something like that. Or some people exaggerate their hurts. Yeah. Oh, Pastor Dave, you can't imagine what it, how much it hurt me that I missed that traffic light. My whole day was in anguish and, you know, and everything else. And they exaggerate because there are some people who like to be hurt. 
They get a lot of their, they get a lot of their self-feeling out of being hurt, out of being wounded. And what you and I need to understand is we need to be honest about our hurts. Now, Rick Warren suggests, and he explains, that these things that I want to express to you. Number one, you need to be honest about your hurts. You need to be honest with yourself. Some people, they have a little garden in their heart where they plant all their hurts and then they tend all the things that have happened. You know, it's like, oh man, you know, my, my, uh, my uncle said this and I'm never going to forget what my uncle said when I was three years old. Come on, folks. Those are real hurts, but they don't need to remain hurts. They need to find a place of healing, but many times people don't want them to be healed because they enjoy having a pity party of one person themselves. So first of all, we need to be honest with ourselves. What things have hurt us? And what do we need to do to find help? The second person that Rick says that we need to talk to about our hurts is God. We need to bring our hurts to him. We need to say, this happened to me, this happened to me. We need to not try and make ourselves somebody strong. We need to say, God, I need help. I need your healing. I need your Holy Spirit to change my heart. And then the third person is we need to find one other in our life that we can trust. Now, if I were you, I would make that one other person either be your spouse or a blood relative that you can trust. But too many times people hide all of these hurts. Too many times people feel like they can identify them and maybe get a little help from God, but there is something that will happen to you if you will just open up and share with another person. You know, I need to tell you this. This happened to me. And there's something, there's something therapeutic. There's something healing. There's something that God created us in us as relational beings when we share our hurt. Oftentimes, we don't want to share our hurt because it's, it's deeply personal. Maybe we're embarrassed. We can share it with ourselves. We can share it with God, but it's hard to share it. But if you can share it with a brother or a sister or somebody that loves you, even if they're not a believer. Now, obviously, it would be best if it's a believer because they can also offer to pray for you and things like that. It can go an awful long way. Some of you are carrying around things that you've never talked to anybody about. And you need to open up and share those things with somebody. So the first thing that we want to... Get it. We, first thing we want to do is we want to be honest about our hurts. Everybody has hurts. Everybody who's here has hurts. But many of us have never acknowledged them openly to ourselves. Well, I don't know what Pastor Dave's talking about. It doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. Or maybe it would be that we haven't asked God to deal with them. And again, that third step of finding somebody that you can trust and believe and open to. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about is to ask you this this question. Do you want to get even to the person that hurt you? Now, not all hurts come from other people, but probably the most profound hurts come from other people. Do you want to get even or do you want to get healed? Do you want to have anger against somebody who maybe is no longer even around? And so you, you build up anger about your hurt or you want to bring these things to Jesus and let Jesus help you and get, let you get healed from these things. It's the most complicated in my experience when dealing with people who are hurt, who are hurt by somebody who is no longer accessible to them and in sometimes no longer living. Somebody who's severely disappointed them, usually parents, uncles, aunts, and they just have that hurt and they, 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 they would rather hold it inside rather than to just release it and say, God, I, I need you to heal me. What's more important to you? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32, we're given instructions how we are supposed to be doing these things. And it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Okay, that's us. As Christians, we need to get rid of evil behavior. We need to get rid of bitterness. We need to get rid of rage. We need to get rid of anger. We need to get rid of harsh words and slander. But instead, we are told, be kind to each other. What is, if I asked you to define kindness, would you know how to put it in words? I promise you, you may not be able to define it, but you can recognize it. Can you think of the kindest person you know? 
It won't be hard for most of you to think, oh, it's either this person or this person or this person or this person. When we describe people, we often think of them as powerful, intelligent, you know, able to get solutions and everything else. But kindness is probably the most important thing we need in the kingdom of God. Kindness to one another. Forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. We all appreciate a person who is kind. And we're supposed to be kind to each other. Let's, let's, like, let's like stamp that on our hearts. Be kind. You often have an opportunity to say something that's unkind, but we don't hesitate to say, we hesitate to say something that's kind. Most of the time, in most situations, you know how to say something to somebody else that's not kind. But you also know how to say something that's kind, and oftentimes we just don't do it. Kindness should be proactive, not reflective. We need to be kind to each other. We need to be tenderhearted. If you're tenderhearted, you care about what happens to other people. You care what happens to other people. We need to be forgiving one another. Now, those of you who are familiar with me know how important this verse is for me. Because when I was a kid, we had little Bible memory cards and we'd look at them at meals and stuff like that. And one of them was, be ye kind one to another for tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you, King James Version. And whenever my sister and I would fight, when the resolution came, and believe me, there had to be a resolution. Yeah, mom and dad called us together and it's like, who did this? Who said what? Da, 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 da. Okay, apologize, apologize, hug, da, da, da. And then we would all recite together, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. It hasn't made me a better person, but it's kept me from being a worse person. Do you understand the difference? I'm not a superstar, but that's been an important thing to memorize. Great thing to memorize. Forgiving one another. What is forgiveness? Who are you not forgiving in your life? You see, forgiveness is not about having an ongoing relationship with them or anything else. It is simply about forgiving them. It is about not keeping score. Oh, you know, well, this thing happened to me like 25 years ago. It doesn't really bother me, but I remember what weather was like that day. I remember how the plants smelled. I remember that. Oh, come on. Years ago, when my, my mom was doing a class on, on uh, asking, t- talking to women about how to be better wives, and she talked about forgiveness. And she said, most of you have something that your husbands did that you've never forgiven them for, and today's the day to forgive them. Just drag it out of your heart and say, I forgive them. And after it was all over, there was this really elegant lady that came up to my mom and said, you're right. When our children were just kids, we were on holiday together. And the kids all wanted ice cream. And my husband was in a hurry. And so he wouldn't let them have ice cream. And I have been mad at him for 30 years about the ice cream. Now, when I first heard that story, I thought it was funny. Now that I've been married for a while, I understand what it means. It's not that we don't love a person that we're mad at. It's just that we keep track and don't forgive of things that we keep in our hearts. It happens with colleagues. It happens with family. It happens with siblings. It happens with spouses. It happens with parents. It happens with children. We're not being asked to to pretend like it never happened in the sense that we forget it. There's no such thing as forgive and forget. You cannot forget. You're human. God gave you a memory. Maybe the reason God gave us memories was so we would have to forgive. But you have to stop keeping score. This is really important. And this verse says why. Why do we forgive? Because we are forgiven. That's it. God demonstrated his love for us. He let his son die on a cross for us. While we were still his enemies, he forgave us because we were forgiven. Do you want to get even? And I promise you, you won't get even no matter what. Let God take care of that. Or do you want to be healed? 
And then finally, the third thing, be honest about your hurts. Ask yourself, do you want to get even or do you want to be healed? And finally, look to the future that God has for you. Look to the future that God has for you. All of us here have a future, no matter how old you are. One of the things that's interesting for me, I'm 68 years old now, and I'm, 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 I'm leaving and retiring from IES in two years, and I'm trying to think what my future is going to be like. Well, I know that I'm going to be engaged. God wants you to be healed from your hurts and your wounds and the things that hold you back from being the person that he created you to be. He still has a plan and purpose for your life. A lot of times I'll hear people say, oh, you know, Pastor Dave, I wish I knew this when I was 20. I wish I knew this when I was 30. I wish I knew this when I was 40. Well, however old you are now, you know it tonight. God has a plan and purpose for you where you are, and part of that is for your hurts to be healed so that you will be able to do the things he created you for. He wants to turn you into the real you, and he has things for you to do. Can you do those things without being healed? Yeah, but you'll do them imperfectly. And you won't be happy doing them. Your happiness will come from being healed. People ask me, what are you going to do after you retire, Pastor Dave? I'm going to work on one thing, and I'm going to work on that one thing, and that's who does God want me to be? Because whatever he has prepared for me is what I'm going to do. I'm going to work on being a better husband. I'm going to work on being a better father. I'm going to work on being a better friend. I'm going to work on praying for I yes. That's what I'm going to do because God has a plan and purpose for my life still. He has a plan and purpose for all of our lives. There's a lot that needs to be done. So I'll tell you a personal story. This is very personal. I discovered the other day through an innocent conversation that somebody had been making up stories about me and sharing them. Not broadly, but tactically. I was so upset. I just, I just, I was so upset. So I thought about what I should do, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I prayed about it. I didn't like the answer I got back from the Lord. I thought about talking to my wife about it, and I didn't want to tell my wife because, to be honest with you, I didn't want to hurt her. Because as upset as I was, I thought that she would be upset too. But finally, I was too upset. And the person that I needed to go to was my wife. And I said, babe, I just found out that this person did this, 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 this. And she said, you know, you just need to forgive them. That's no help. <laughs> I wanted to be validated in my anger, you know. But what I realized was, when she told me that, she was the second person that day that told me that. And the first person was Jesus. That Jesus told me to forget it. My wife told me to forget it. And so I thought, okay, I get the message. And then we're going through soap, and somewhere down the line, we're having a question and answer. And if you were in soap with me, maybe you know, but yeah, yeah I don't even remember which soap. I'm in too many soap groups, Okay. But in the soap group, in the discussion, the thing's almost over, and somebody says to me, oh, by the way, Pastor Dave, I need to know, what are you supposed to do when somebody's spreading false stories about you? I thought, Lord, please, I get it, I get it, I get it, you know? And I told him, just forget about it, just forget them, just go on, just ignore it. But not ignore it, forgive and move on. Forgive and move on. I realized that I had no choice. You see, there's something about this. No matter what age you are, every day that you live, you're building your future. Now, your future may be longer, your future may be shorter, but you're building your future. I, I've told you this before. I used to coach basketball. I was very strict. You do the drills properly. You do them well because the way you practice is the way you'll play in a game. And the things you do in life, you do them right and you do them well because the way you behave under ordinary circumstances, will be the way you will behave when the pressure's on you. If you tell the truth when it's easy, you'll tell the truth when it's hard. If you lie about small things, you'll lie about big things. When somebody's done something to offend you and you forgive them, it'll be easier to offend a big offense. You must live understanding the future. Every single day, every day, you are building your future. You also need to make the choice 
to build and to choose the godly future that you want. In other words, you say, God, whatever it is that you have me, whatever you've created me for, it's not building what I want. I want to be what you want me to be. So you're choosing that future and your choice is the godly one. Now, this is the key. Sometimes people struggle with their past, especially if they've been hurt. I never want to belittle that, okay? Don't misunderstand. But every day that you live, you're creating a new past. What you and I do today, tomorrow becomes our past. And if your past is something that you struggle with, create a godly past by living in a godly manner now. So that when you look back and when others look back later on, they look back on the wonderful and good things that you did rather than maybe the things that were earlier on. So, this is the Lord's table. Now, we all understand that this is something symbolic that has to do with the idea of when Jesus was together with his disciples sitting at the table. And the interesting thing in that book of uh, John chapter 2 is Jesus turned the water into wine. Now, there are many people who have written whole theologies about that this is sort of a predecessor for the idea of the Lord's table and everything else. No, I, I don't think so. From a biblical scholar point of view, John is a smart man and he's a good writer. If he wanted to make that connection, he would have made it obvious. But you and I, who are modern day Christians, or any Christian living for the last 2,000s years, would recognize that when we take the Lord's table together, there's wine there. And Jesus provides the wine. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying John's intention is for us to automatically think of the Lord's table. But I'm saying that you and I can be reminded of the Lord's table. Because in that wedding in Canaan of Galilee 2,000 years ago, we don't even know where that town really is. In that wedding, Jesus provided something. And that something made the difference. And 2,000 years ago, he gathered with his disciples and he shared a meal. And he gave them a piece of bread and said, this reminds us that we're all from one loaf. And he had them drink a cup. And he said, you'll understand this. This is my blood which is poured out for you. And when he died on the cross, they understood what he had been talking about a few evenings earlier. And at that point, because Jesus had told him, whenever you get together, you do this in remembrance of me. At that point, the Christians began to drink a cup and eat bread together because they want to be reminded of what Jesus did for them. You and I understand that what he offers us on the cross by his shed blood is healing and forgiveness. Although there are some distortions of the idea, it's very clear that the early disciples understood that based on the Isaiah passage, that our spiritual healing comes from the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And whoever you are and whatever's happened in your life, God has a plan and purpose for you, but it involves being willing to be healed from your hurts. And the beginning of the healing is to ask him. So I want to invite all of you to take out the piece of bread You're with friends. We're the body of Christ here. This piece of bread reminds us that we're the body of Christ. Don't take it yet. I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you all, as you've closed your eyes, if there are people here who have been hurt and you've been struggling with finding healing from your hurts, and you recognize and acknowledge that at the table of the Lord, as you acknowledge the blood of Jesus shed on the cross for your healing, can be the beginning place. And you commit yourself to finding healing in Jesus for the things that have hurt you, to find forgiveness, to find healing, to find redemption. I want to offer to pray for you. I want to offer maybe to be your third person. So people's eyes are closed. And if there are those of you who need to 
say, Pastor Dave, I, I need, there's hurts that I need to deal with, that I need God's help. We're going to take the communion in a minute, but if there are those who would like me to be praying for you, would you just very quietly stand to your feet and say, Pastor Dave, pray for me. I'm hurt. I need to be healed. And I'll pray for those who are standing. Thank you for those who stood. Are there any others? This is echoing in your heart. Now wait just a moment longer. Now would you all stand? Father, you've told us from the instruction from your son that when we eat the bread, we acknowledge that we are all from the same loaf. We all belong to the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And because of that, we care one for another. So we, we bless you that you didn't leave us alone, but you gave us each other. And we value and we treasure those that you have given us to, the body that we belong to. Let's eat the bread. Now prepare, open your cup. Father, you let your son die on a cross. You watched him die for all of us. For the things that we cannot do in ourselves, we cannot overcome our hurts, we cannot overcome our things that others have done. We need your help, we need your spirit. As we drink this, we acknowledge our helplessness and we ask you to help us. And I especially lift up my brothers and sisters who stood for special prayer for the hurts that they have. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out in a very real and special way to their hearts today and that you would help them to overcome those hurts that they have. Lead them by your Spirit, Lord. If they need help, even professional help, send them in the right direction. Now let's drink the cup. Father, I thank you for each and every one who is here. And I pray, Lord, that we would receive and we would have the desire in our hearts to be everything that you want us to be. Just remain standing. If Edwin, who's one of our deacons, is going to come and lead us in prayer for Indonesia, and then we're going to sing a song in honor of Independence Day. But let me remind you that independence is a decision that we make, and we need to choose to be independent from this world and be a part of his kingdom. Please remain standing. But please come. And after he finishes his prayer, we'll be singing a song together. ninth Independence Day. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings and provisions you have provided our beloved country, Indonesia. Father, it is not easy to govern this vast and diverse country, but for you, nothing is impossible. Amen. So we ask you, Lord, please touch and bless our leaders of this country, in particular, we pray for a strong and just leadership by the President-elect Prabowo Subianto Joyo Hadikusumo, who will be inaugurated next October. Please touch, bless, and lead him that he would form a credible cabinet who will be making and executing policies to benefit the people of Indonesia.
We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to bring our needs to you. Please help us to see and be able to discern whatever your decisions are for us. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Satu nusa, satu bangsa, satu bahasa kita tanah air pasti jaya untuk selama lamanya Indonesia pusaka Indonesia tercinta Nusa bangsa Hey, thank you for joining our service. I hope you learned. I hope you had a good time with us during the service. If you would like to involve with us, we have an online ministry. It's called Booster Pack. You can uh, involve by click the link on the, on, the, on the chat board, on the comment, and we'll see you there. And thank you. Hope you have a blessed weekend.